you do need to be careful who you listen to, but also be, you know, be mindful where the data is coming from because, because that can, that can also make a big difference to, to the outcome of, of, of your view. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills and their money and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests every minute of every day. We're investing our time, our skills, our energy and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening. And now let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Who do you turn to when you want to make a big decision? Do you just make up your own mind or do you seek advice from others? And if you seek out others... Who do you seek advice from and why? Over the years, I've found that we all seek advice for very different reasons. And some of us look for it more than others. Perhaps we're wired to want safety over adventure. Or perhaps we've had experiences that make us fearful of losing control or facing failure or rejection. Some of us seek advice when the complexity of the situation baffles our knowledge. And when we're doing something for the first time, or when the stakes are high and a mistake can be very costly. And while advice can certainly guide us towards a favourable outcome, our ability to discern good advice from bad is the key to making good decisions in our lives. Now, this can be difficult in a world where there's an overabundance of information and no shortage of advice. Everything we see, hear or read, including this podcast, has something to say about what we need to do differently to be more successful, more fulfilled, wealthy, you name it. And then add on to that the personal advice we're given by well-meaning people around us who take it upon themselves to guide us in just about everything. Over the years, I've found that everyone in Australia is an expert on investing particularly in shares and property. It doesn't matter whether you're at the pub, or at a barbie on the weekend, at the hairdressers or at work, someone's always happy to share their opinion. And the funniest thing about all of this is that those with the strongest opinions and who talk loudest and strongest about investments generally don't own any, or if they do, not for very long. As a wise person once said, Talk is cheap because it's the only thing broke people can afford. And in this regard, supply certainly exceeds demand. Now, this has led me to the creation of the law of inverse investment that I explain in my book, The Freedom Formula. It goes a little bit like this. The louder and the stronger a person's opinion on investment, the less likely it is that they're qualified to comment. Now, Greek philosopher Plato's words also ring true here when he said... Wise people talk because they have something to say. Fools, because they have to say something. Now, unless your family and friends are active investors, don't ask them. Even Jesus' early friends didn't believe he was a Messiah. And the same goes for a lot of mainstream media commentators. You need to seek out proven performers who have access to current quality information have the expertise to interpret it, and have no vested interest in the advice that they provide. Let's face it, investments are high cost and potentially high risk process. If the myriad of complex and dynamic information is not interpreted correctly to suit your particular circumstance. Now this doesn't mean you need to reinvent the wheel and try and do it all yourself. 
because a half-baked part-time job is likely to end in disaster because you just don't know what you don't know. So who can you trust to advise you on high-cost investments? And how can you trust them? As outlined in Charles H. Green's groundbreaking book, The Trusted Advisor, trust is built on the integrated combination of four key criteria, credibility, reliability, intimacy and self-interest. Credibility is what someone has done and said. Reliability is about someone repeatedly doing what they say they're going to do. Intimacy relates to feeling comfortable emotionally with someone, that intuitive gut feel based on openness and honesty. And lastly, self-interest, the degree of impartial independence versus the level of vested interest. This is the most important but often ignored ingredient. So when you find someone whose advice you trust, follow up. It may not be perfect, and that's okay. You have enough to begin, and your answers will grow, change, or expand as you take action. i found that life is best lived in a lab coat, experimenting with what you know in the moment. If it doesn't work out, you learn. If it does work out, you still learn. The key thing here is to take action and not get stuck in analysis paralysis, as there's always going to be an excuse why now's not the right time. Doing your research and then doing something is what life is all about. So there's my two cents of advice. Take what appeals to you, leave out the rest, and always be willing to change course. Let's take the example of property research. Over the last 20 years, I've seen a big shift from no information to too much information. We've gone from trying to make property decisions by searching for a very few dots and, and trying to join them to being buried in dots and not knowing which dots to join. The property noise has become absolutely deafening and overwhelming. So how can you make sense of it all? You guessed it, by listening to today's high-profile guest. Nerida Connorsby is the chief economist with the REA Group, who are changing the way the world views property. REA is the parent company of realestate.com.au, realcommercial.com.au, and a host of other digital property businesses globally. And Nerida is recognised as one of Australia's leading property experts. She provides regular market commentary to a wide range of Australian media outlets across digital, print, television and radio. She's got more than 20 years of property research experience throughout Asia Pacific and has held senior positions with, within commercial agencies and major consulting firms over that time. Her expertise covers residential and commercial property from both an investor and an occupier's perspective. And Narada also holds a Bachelor of Commerce with Honours and a Masters of Commerce, majoring in econometrics. With nearly 7 million searches a day and over 5 million Australians using the realestate.com.au website every month, that's one in four of us, Nerida has a very fine-tuned sense of what's happening in property nationally. With a wealth of data at her fingertips, Nerida marries the fundamental market drivers of real estate with the way we behave online to extract unparalleled insights. Now, You've probably all heard that old joke about why astrology was invented. So economics would seem like an accurate science. But for me, the quality of economic projections has been about the quality of the data, the quality of the modelling, and most importantly, the quality of the person interpreting the data. In this regard, Nerida has no equal. Nerida doesn't have a magic crystal ball but she has the next best thing. Current buyer and seller behaviour patterns that bridges the gulf between logical and emotionally driven decision making around property. So in today's really interesting discussion, Narada shares her insights on where property is heading around the country and which locations show good long-term growth potential. So listen closely as you enjoy Narada Connorsby.
Hey, Freedom Fighters, uh, Bushy Martin back. And as an active long-term investor, I'm always looking for forward-looking, predictive and trustworthy insights from well-informed quality researchers to help make really good decisions. And in this regard, you can't get better than today's guest. Not only does she have access to more relevant and current information than anyone else in the industry, but she also has the economic smarts to interpret it properly. Now, I was lucky enough to catch up with Nehru at uh, David Kosher's recent property technology talk, and it reminded me that not only is she savvy, but she's one of the nicest people in the game. So welcome, and let's get invested, Nehru. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. I've been uh, wanting to get you on for quite a while and very appreciative uh, of you spending the time. But uh, And you, you're obviously really well known with a very high media profile across the industry now. But for those that have been living under a rock, can you just give us a quick rundown <laughs> on who you are, what you're doing and where you're currently he- heading, please, Nerida? Sure. So uh, I'm the Chief Economist for REA Group. And I have over 25 years property research experience. Uh, my role now is, uh, as you said, a primarily a media role. So I uh, provide commentary on the market. Um, I, I provide a lot of discussion around the data we see uh, with regards, not just historical pricing data, uh, but also a lot of the data that we're seeing around search. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking, so um, frequently travelling uh, around Australia, a little bit in Asia as well. We own uh, property portals uh, throughout Asia, so I have been spending quite a bit of Hong Kong, quite a bit of time in Hong Kong over the past 12 months as well. Uh, and I also do a lot of video and um, provide a lot of written content for our site. So uh, the meet, uh, the new sites on, on realestate.com.au and also Real Commercial. Yeah, awesome. Excellent. Uh, I'll sort of give more information in the intro around REA Group and uh, the fact that you've got coverage across realestate.com.au and, and the commercial space and a whole bunch of other bits and bobs across that whole arena. But uh, tell me, for those that want to sort of understand your journey so far, uh, can you sort of take us back to where it all began? And I want you to go back as far back as, as you'd like to and take us okay. through what you did, why you did it, what you learned from it, and how did that get you to where you are now? Sure. Uh, so, um, all right, so maybe if I take it back to, to high school. I, I was very good at maths okay. and I um, did at the time, this is 1990s Melbourne, maths A and B in, in year 12, I uh, also did chem, um, chemistry biology. So I was, I was a very math science student. Yep. Uh, I graduated and wasn't really sure uh, what I wanted to do, but I, you know, I wanted to do something to do with numbers because that was what I, I really loved working with and um, ended up getting into Melbourne Uni and doing a, um, and starting a, a Bachelor of Commerce uh, degree. So I started that. Um, was very, did a lot of math subjects. So I did a lot of, um, math subjects within the science faculty. Um, obviously did, you know, standard macro, micro, uh, economic subjects as well. Yeah. Uh, and at that stage, I did the first year. They made us all do accounting. I was terrible at accounting. Really? Um, Why? I mean, for, <laughs> yeah, okay. Are you just I boring know, or? I, love maths. Just... I, I think so. I don't know. The depreciation schedules and things really didn't <laughs> interest me, but, um, <laughs> I did love math. So I was actually, it was interesting. I started first year Bachelor of Commerce. I was going to shift over into a pure, um, science degree and, and continue on with, uh, maths, uh, yeah. pure maths. But, uh, it started to get quite, um, theoretical at that stage. So, you know, I remember I was doing, um, a subject that was purely on complex numbers and, uh, we had to do a proof of one plus one equals two. And so, there was this massive amount of work that went into this proof. And um, at the same time, I was also doing quite a few stats subjects and um, and decided at that time that I could really relate more to statistics and yeah. how that relates to the real world as opposed to uh, theoretical maths, which, um, you know, is, is interesting, but... Um, you know, in terms of a career and, you know, where I would go beyond the university, track. it was a little bit more restrictive. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you, don't, you didn't see yourself as Einstein. Uh, no. <laughs> rediscovering <laughs> I was the world. Any, or, or being an academic, I suppose that was, a, you know, at that time I thought, well, that's probably not my career path. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can. It stats is is I mean from someone who only touches on it. It is really interesting looking at trends and where it's heading and what it means. And I could I could see that uh, you would love that. Yeah, look, and it was fascinating. And so I, I continued on with my degree, um, really focused in on econometrics, so the statistical uh, analysis of of economies. Uh, it was the early nineties. I, I finished my my um, finished my bachelor degree early nineties. wasn't many jobs. Um, I did. I did get offered a job within the uh, federal government. Uh, got moving to Canberra. I also got offered a job uh, in a bank, and um, and then the other job. So that, that was once I'd finished my bachelor. And then the third job I got offered was um, working for Professor Ian Harper at the Melbourne Business School as a research assistant. So I had the, the three choices: I could go to the bank, I could uh, go to Canberra, or I could go work. Uh, Ian Harper, and so I, I decided to work for Ian Harper because I thought, well, he's a he's a fascinating person, and you know, I could definitely learn a lot from him. Yep. Uh, and so I went to work for him, but then at the same time, started my masters, and and at that stage, really got stuck into um, numbers even more so, and econometrics more so, and ended up doing my thesis looking at the household expenditure survey unit record data. Uh, and doing a real deep dive into gambling behaviour in Australia. So, okay. so at that time, I mean, you can imagine back then trying to do econometric analysis with large data sets. It was it was quite difficult and very Clanking, time clumsy. consuming. Yeah, I bet <laughs> yes, you. Right. Oh my goodness, I can't even imagine yeah. what it must have been like at that stage. Trying to draw yeah. blood out of a stone, I would have thought, was it? Yeah, it was a nut. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Took a long time to run things. So you know, like now when I look at you know our data teams and our data scientists and how quickly things can can be manipulated. It is uh, quite incredible seeing that. So, mm. um, so yes, yeah, so I worked at Ian Harper for a year. It was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and then I got offered a job. So you have to remember, this is early nineties. There wasn't many jobs around, no. and especially in Melbourne, it was it was very very high unemployment. Um, but I was I was really lucky. I got offered a job for a company. At the time, called Jeb Holland Demasi, they became Urbis uh, eventually. But um, doing forecasting for commercial property owners and primarily oh. their shopping centres, and also um, also retailers, so retailers like Woolworths, for example. So, oh, yeah. so it was really good. Like I got to combine maths, um, and then and that was really my I guess my entry into the property industry. I, I didn't really have. Uh, a strong knowledge of the property industry. You know, my parents never invested in housing. You know, we lived in a house that they owned and um, certainly didn't study it at uni. You know, it was not, wasn't something that I studied at uni. But once I started in property, uh, it, it just really grabbed me. And, um, you know, I, I, to this day, I still, I, mean, I still find it so fascinating. But really, that's when I really started to develop a really strong interest in it. Yeah, well, I can see that... Uh, I, what I'm picking up on is that you had an attraction to the the stats component, so you're looking for real world tangibility, and there's there's nothing more real and tangible than property. So if you're applying that sort of econometrics approach to to property, it would have been pretty rare at that time of the game. I would have thought, Nerida. Yeah, look, it was unusual. Like, it, you know, it wasn't there wasn't much people could do with regards to data, and and I so I think people weren't so fascinated with property back then and you know at the time the main goals for economists were to work for a bank or to work for government yeah. uh, or or you know basically they, those were the two options so um, at the time it you know it was it was a I guess a little bit of an unusual choice but given what's happened to people's interest in property it's turned out to be a, a very very good decision to, to enter the property industry that early on Totally. Let's let's just very quickly talk about that. Uh, you, you've obviously seen a change in the level of interest in property then to now. What what do you think's driven that? Oh, look, I think it's uh, look. I think the main thing has been how well people have done out of property, yeah. and um, it, it's interesting. You know, we we used to own a, a site in Italy called Casa dot com, and. Uh, in Italy, they're not so property obsessed, and the, on our site, you know, people just take photos themselves and throw them up on there, and um, <laughs> it, it, they just didn't, you know, we just didn't get the same same level of activity that we see here in Australia. I mean, we did, we've done a survey recently, a property seeker survey, and 
fifty percent of people say that they just prop, they you know they they like to just browse property for the sake of it. You know, they're just on there to to just to have a look around. Whereas um, in Italy with cars, we you know we, we never really found that. And I think I think it's partly because you know we've never had a big property or we haven't had a big property downturn for a long time we have we've obviously had a had the most recent downturn mm, which that's a um yeah yeah it was a blip you know it was funny i mean we can go back to talking about that but you know it definitely was a blip but you know if you look long term in australia uh people that have invested in property or even people that just bought their own home have have done very well from from doing so mm, I, I know so we've got property in the states and uh we were canvassing at that around that sort of gfc point uh, growth zones around the world, and there's just nowhere that beats the sort of growth sustainably that we see in Australia. It's, there's some good yield plays elsewhere, but not the sort of growth. What about with your sort of global reach? Do you see the same thing? Yeah, look, I'd agree. I mean, I think it's. I think there. I mean, there would be markets that are seeing strong growth, but I think the the safety of Australia is is a key, and um, you know, we, we do have a stable government. There's low sovereign risk. Uh, you know, we're, we're a grow, growing economy and we're not growing that fast at the moment, but you know, we're, we're still a growth economy. If we, you know, we have a look at, uh, other Asian markets. I mean, Hong Kong was seen as a, a, a very strong growth, very safe market, but with political instability there, it's, it's looking pretty rough. Um, you know, you could invest in Thailand or Malaysia, but you know, there, there are issues around sovereign yeah. risk and also the instability of those countries. So, yeah. you know, I think in terms of safety, I mean, you, you really, like, really cannot go past Australia at the moment. Totally, totally. Absolutely. Okay. So it sort of ended up almost by, uh, accident in the, in the property space that, that's obviously led to some pretty interesting things. Talk us about the, the rest of the journey that, that got you towards, uh, what, where you are now and some of the challenges you faced along that journey. Sure. So I, I spent ten, about ten years in consulting, and um, and that you know it was great. I I, I enjoyed that, and um, I you know went worked overseas in Canada for a year, working for a, for a forecasting firm there, and that was a lot of fun. Um, worked on some interesting projects, uh, but then a, a job came up at. Um, I can't, oh, Jeb Holland, um, James Lang LaSalle. So James Lang LaSalle, yeah. head, head of research for Victoria came up and, um, and I thought, oh, well, you know, that, that sounds like an interesting role, interesting mm. company. Um, and, and the, I applied for the job, got the job. And, and at that stage I realized, um, like I really loved, I, I, I just love that job. So it was a really great, fun job working in research. Um, yeah, started to do more media, started to do more presenting. And, yeah. um, and, and had a lot of fun with it. You know, it was a, it's, it's a, it's a great company, a global, a global, you know, working with global yeah. research teams was a yeah. lot of fun, you know, so it was, yeah. um, so that was really interesting. Um, so I spent, spent about six, yeah, spent six years there. Um, had, had two kids during that time. So, okay. you know, t- took a bit of time, you know, a bit of time off during that time. And then, yeah. um, came back from maternity leave after my son was born and, uh, and that was GFC, but it was just post GFC. And, and I think I, I think I did time his birth quite well because it was, um, I basically was out of the market <laughs> while, while all the global well financial crisis. <laughs> so that wasn't planned. That was just a <laughs> happened. No, thing. I left. Yeah, I left and it was red hot and I came back and it was looking really bad, but people, you know, people, it was very, it was quite disconcerting coming back actually. I mean, I only obviously knew what had happened, but. There had been a lot of fallout in the property industry over that time, and yeah. you know there was particularly commercial property. You know, people were were pretty, um, you know, very very concerned about the future. And yeah. um, and then and then I got offered a role at um, Collier's as their national head of research. Okay. So so I went from um, JLL, um, the Victorian role, and then I went to across to Collier's as as their head of research, and um, and, and that was a really Again, a really great role. So, um, they, they didn't have such a, they, they've got, they've got a global footprint, but mm. the, the global research team didn't have such an influence over what we did in Australia. So, oh. um, they pretty much let me go in terms of, of what I did. Um, and pretty, you know, so we were able to, to, I had a, a really good marketing person, Zara Hall, that I was working very closely with then. And so we launched some great reports and, yeah. um, and again, I, I continue to do a lot of events. So I think that's probably what, what helped me once I got mm. this role is that I was 
already doing a lot of public speaking and um, and so the switch to doing media wasn't such a shock as, as it may have been if I hadn't been doing that. Yeah, it's an interesting mix because the introversion of uh, stats and, and reviewing numbers and, and big data versus the sort of very outward uh, public extroverted nature of a lot of what you do is quite a rare combination narrative. Where did that come from? Was was that sort of situational or you've just always been quite out there but, but had a, a very analytical brain that really wants to delve into why and, and what are the numbers telling me? Uh, look, I think I've probably changed over time that I was, you know, probably a lot more uh, reserved and kind of heads down as, as a younger person. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think I think, you know, doing events was something that really pushed me out there and really tested me a lot. So, I mean, one, one of the things that really did help me was uh, the Property Council started to change who they put up on stage and who they put on panels. And there was a really strong focus on, on getting a mix of um, men and women and, you know, getting younger people and older people and um, and really try they, – they were really working hard to try and mix up their panels and their, you know, yeah. the people speaking and – um, and as a result, you know, I, that, that really, you know, I still to this day think that that was one of the things that really changed the way that I communicated because they, they gave me an opportunity to push me out there and, um, right. and, and it really helped me professionally. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, Colliers, where, where to from Colliers? Yeah, so Colliers, I was, um, approached by REA, um, to do a spot on Sky, um, in, that was probably, gosh, probably about, Five years ago now, and yeah. um, they had a um, they had a, a show that they were sponsoring on a Saturday called Sky Real Estate, yeah. and um, they approached me for that. And you know, I, at the time, I was working for Colliers, and you know, I couldn't really work for Colliers and REA, you know, REA on the weekends and Colliers during the week. <laughs> I mean, like, my role at Colliers was big. You know, I had a big research team. I was managing you know nine people and. You know, producing a lot of research products. I was doing more overseas. So, you know, the, the, the role at Collies had grown from, you know, head of Australian research to doing, a, you know, a lot more. I was looking after a, a head of data person as well. So, you know, there was a lot going on at Collies. And so trying mm. to fit in REA was a bit hard. So, yeah. um, so it didn't really work out. And then I kept in contact. They kept in contact with me. And then within about five months, um, REA came back to me and said, oh, look, we've got a, you know, we think we can make this into a, a full-time role and um and then from there we just you know just kept chatting and and then i joined rea um yeah nearly four years ago yeah okay it's well, been a meteoric ride since then but I, let's just talk about because uh, what i'm hearing is uh obviously uh very passionate about what you do but you're juggling very busy career you're managing people you've got a high media profile you've got two kids that you're you're juggling with how, how have you managed to negotiate all of that and, and still be as happy and, and friendly and, and outward as, as you do a lot of people would struggle with that those multiple challenges um i guess it's, i mean i've got a, a great husband and you know he's he does do a lot of the the child care and a lot of the you know household stuff so yeah, you know i guess all... i'm really lucky i've got a, a very supportive husband in that respect yeah um well, you know, REA has just got such a great culture. So not only do I feel supported at home, but I feel supported in the workplace. And, and I think this is really important that if, you know, if you don't feel like people have got your back and, you know, are supporting you, then it, it is quite difficult to, um, to be able to do your job. So, yeah. you know, I guess that's part of it. And then, and then just the roles. I mean, it's just so, I, I feel so fortunate to have such an amazing job and to do what I do that, um, and also to do something that I find so fascinating, you know, working with these amazing data sets and working in the industry as well. You know, the people I meet are just so interesting and, you know, I love I love hearing, you know, people's involvement and, and their interests and their yeah. theories about what's happening. And, yes. I, you know, I think that that's, that's for me is quite fascinating. And, yeah. you know, I, I guess I've never been someone to sort of shove my views down people's throats, but... You know, I know a lot of people in, in my types of roles can be, but one of the things I, I, I do find fascinating is just listening to, to people's opinions and, you know, and I suppose, you know, they, they can sometimes even shape mine that you, you, you hear it from a different perspective and, um, and it does, you know, it does start to, to sort of form 
you know, help me form views as to what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I, what, I, what I love about what you do, because as a, I find uh, it's still unfortunately the property game is can be quite a testosterone-filled boys' club uh, with, a, with a bunch of guys who make some pretty big assertions based on gut feel with no, no supporting info whatsoever, uh, whereas uh, why I uh, pay pretty special attention when when you're talking is that I know that it's backed up with not only uh, good data but quality data and, and you do have those economic smarts that then can interpret that in a way that's actually meaningful. So uh, have you had any challenges with, with, the, with, with the boys club? And also uh, I, I guess what I see with a lot of media commentators in Australia, you go on this sort of journey where everyone loves you initially and then you sort of hit this sort of uh, tipping point where suddenly you're a tall poppy and then people are looking to kick you down. Have you had uh, any funny games with, with that on your journey so far? Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's, over, it's interesting. I mean, I have been working in a very male-dominated field my whole career. So, um, and so I, I guess I kind of, I mean, I'm, you know, I've obviously had people sort of trying to kick me down and, and, you know, undermine me, not listen to me, you know, all those things. Mm, so, yeah. so I think that's, you know, I, I guess I've, I've become quite used to that and okay. also, I guess, developed ways of dealing with it. Cause I'm kind of like, well, you know what? If you don't want to listen to me, you don't have to. And, um, if you don't agree with me, you don't have to. Um, I'm saying it how I see it. I, yeah. I don't have a vested interest, you know, no, I'm I... not. I'm not a property developer in <laughs> somewhere trying to flog something I'm building. I'm not, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have a product. I work for REA Group. I mean, they've been, it's interesting because, I mean, they have, have really let me say what I want. You know, I, I don't get pulled in to say, you know, can you stop saying that? Might upset a customer or don't say that. <laughs> the developers aren't happy. You know, so I, so yeah. I guess I, you know, on one hand, I, I'm used to working in a very male dominated field. I'm used to, trying to be heard you know I suppose that was the other thing too that it did take me some time to to be heard and and then also just um again you know working in a role where I'm not directed to say anything in particular but to talk you know what how I see it and Mm. where I see the future going is is you know a pretty good position to be in well it's backed up too it's it's not you're, you're not just saying things off the top of your head you've actually got data to support the comments that you're making and that's I think the big difference between yourself and, and others in the space. So uh, Yeah, I mean, this is it. I mean, we, we just have so much information and, and, and a lot of it is, I mean, you know, it, it, the data I get goes towards informing my view. It's, you know, I don't really see the data in itself being the story. And, yeah. um, I mean, a lot of the things too that, you know, there's so much data out there and a lot of, you know, people often think, you know, the data is the data, but, you know, the reality is there's there's good quality data and there's poor quality data. Um, once yeah. you start doing modelling, once you start doing forecasting, I mean, there's there's a lot that can change and a lot of, um, you know, models are highly malleable. And, you know, and I think people in the general public don't don't realise that, uh, you know, a forecasting model can can be put out quite easily. And the more the more complicated you make that forecasting model, the more the more um, changeable it can be made by um, you know just tweaking a few assumptions so you know i I think that's the thing too that you do need to be careful who you listen to but also be you know be mindful where the data is coming from because because that can that can also make a big difference to to the outcome of 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 your view Uh, absolutely it's the interpretation of the data that's the key bit for me so you, uh, you know, there's there's lots of data out there, but it's how you actually interpret the data. What what, what data do you actually listen to, and then how do you interpret that in terms of future moves? There's a, there's a lot of rear vision mirror stuff, and there's there's buckets of that around that tells you nothing but what happened in the past. What I'm more interested in, uh, and I think uh, sitting on realestate.com with looking at uh, people's actual buying behaviour through what they're searching for is is very relevant to what people are doing right here, right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll dig into that in a moment. But um, d- let, let's talk about big data because it, it's, uh, you know, there's the, we're going through the Googleization of the world and it, Google's made it really crystal clear that their, their single aim really is to cut anyone out of the middle and go direct to source. 
and we're going to see some major uh, ongoing changes with AI and, and technology that will affect property and finance across the board. Can you sort of comment on how you see that affecting you and the REA group and then broader in terms of the impact that that's likely to have on the property industry and, and markets over the next five to ten years? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, oh, yeah, God, there's, so, there's so many impacts. I mean, the way, I mean, oh, okay, so I guess starting with, with players like Google and Facebook and Instagram and, and all those, you know, the, those bigger um, social media sites, hmm. um, yeah, they, they are major competitors to us. You know, we, we, can, we can clearly see that, you know, they decided to make a play into property that could make a big difference to, to our business. Yeah. Um, in terms of, in terms of the way that we're looking forward for our business, a lot of it's around, um, keeping people on, on the, um, people, keeping people engaged throughout their lives and not just when they're specifically in a, a situation where they want to rent or buy or, or sell. So, yes. um, so that, that's, that's where we're real, where, where we, we are really focused upon. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's that un- different to most tech companies. I mean, it's interesting, you know, that, that, um, David Koch, um, dinner that we we're at that, um, there was a, one of the guys that was, that had come through, oh, that was there from one of the digital banks. And, mm. and it was interesting his comments around, you know, in the end, we see ourselves as providing a much better service to, um, to the, the community and, you know, I always thought of digital banks, oh, you know, it'll be a disruption play and they'll drive down pricing and, you know, make it really good, you know, from a price perspective. Yeah. But, you know, they, they don't see themselves as that way. And, you know, that's, that's great. You know, I think that's pretty consistent with us is that, you know, we're, we're looking at ways that we can keep people engaged in, is the yeah. main one, but also help them. So I think, you know, one, one good example that, that we have is, um, that we're looking at and, and actively developing is, um, you know, if you're someone that we know is a renter on our site, um, you know, we would be able to say to them, you know, providing they want to give us the information, um, you know, you're paying this much rent. Um, did you know if you um, wanted to um, buy a property, you know, you could potentially be paying this much in the property in your area, um, you know, do you want to talk to an agent or mm. would you like, would you like to talk to a finance provider? And yep. yeah, so those sorts of things is kind of what, what we're looking at in the future. And I think that will probably be fairly similar, uh, to most, um, online businesses is that, you know, it's all about keeping people engaged and, and yeah. keeping them on site. Well, that, that, that engagement piece, well, I, I guess the, the, the delicate balance that I, I now see is that let's face it, the, uh, mainstream mass media are under under threat in terms of their own livelihood. So what I'm seeing with the uh, mass media is that their only way of maintaining any engagement is to scare the hell out of us. So yes. uh, there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of fear thrown in there and, and it's always at the extremes because that's that's the headline that's the one that's going to grab us. How, how do you negotiate through that in, in relation to getting airspace yourself but also making sure that the the insights, the information you provided are... are are actually not just you know, scaremongering, but real relevant insights. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting that, you know, the most recent downturn was an, was an interesting time for us because um, there, there was a lot of scaremongering. I mean, we, you had commentators on 60 Minutes saying prices were going to fall 45%. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you had people who I, you know, I respect coming out and saying prices would drop by 25%. And... Um, and, and it was interesting, you know, we were, we were looking, you know, obviously we were looking at what, um, was coming out in the, in the media with regards to where pricing was going. Mm. Um, we, we weren't seeing the same sorts of falls and, you know, no. this is something that we are, we're continuing to, to work on that we, you know, we, we've, I mean, we're still not seeing, you know, we, we just don't see such big swings at a capital city level as some other people see and, yeah. Um, you know, we're trying to work out if we're, we're wrong. I mean, we're spending a lot of time looking closely at our pricing models and, you know, just kind of wondering what's, what the difference is. But as prices were falling, you know, we weren't seeing it. Um, I suppose the difficult part, the difficult situation I was in is that I was kind of, you know, I wasn't kind of saying, I was saying, look, it's, it's not actually that bad. And I mm. don't think, you know, I really can't see it falling by 25%. And this is a situation that's come about. From, yeah, it's been 
implemented by government. You know, it's it's been driven by a royal commission. It's not a exactly economic crisis that's leading to this. Yep. Yeah, and so you know, I kept saying, you know, I said it, and you know, I've got a pretty big, obviously, um, you know, we've obviously got that great relation with relationship with News Corp. They're a majority shareholder, so yeah, you know, I, just, I kept saying it, but you, you know, you're right. It was, um, it, it was a time that. You know, to come out and be fairly moderate and say, well, you know, it's not the, not the end of the world was, was not something that a lot of people wanted to hear. And, um, yeah. and to come out and say the market was going to fall by 45%, you know, that was <laughs> something that played in to people's, I don't know, like, you know, well, it made people very, very nervous, but it also, um, was something that the media was, was quite keen on, on publishing. Yeah, I find it interesting because uh, I, I, I guess in, I've been in the game for a long time now, but I, what I saw happening in Sydney was what I was expecting to see in Sydney and that's we, we've sort of overlay uh, particular areas and, and uh, the old S-curve uh, exercise is something that we see in, in locations quite often where we'll see, let, let's say a property cycle takes 8 to 15 years uh, what we generally see is a, a spike in prices over a three to five year period. Uh, then it'll, it, sometimes it'll do a bit of a correction of up to ten percent. Then it'll go flat to five to eight years, and you'll see a spike again. Uh, it seems we've seen that regularly happen in in suburbs and locations around the country. So when when I saw uh, Sydney come back ten uh, percent or so, I was like, well, yeah, that's exactly what I would expect to see in Sydney. Yet the the media wanted to make it out like the the sky was falling in. So you, when you sort of put some parameters around that and you, we start to look at the, the overall trends, then what, what we're seeing in those locations, and Melbourne's no different, is exactly what we expect. So all I've been saying to investors is just hold your hats. Uh, this, this is what we expect to see. Uh, sit back. There's, there's nothing exciting in property and you're only in trouble if you actually have to buy or sell at that particular time. If you're not, if you're in the long term, just, just ride the wave, ignore the press and get on with life. Uh, how does that fit in with with your view of things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we could see how red hot Sydney was on the way up. I mean, it, pricing increased between by around seventy percent percent between two thousand and eleven and two thousand seventeen. So mm. you know, and and then you know, the Royal Commission came in, and it's, you know, as soon as a discussion about a Royal Commission was you know really was was starting to happen, it was September. I think the Royal Commission started was formally announced in December, but yeah. Sydney pricing started to turn and. Um, and yeah, Sydney, Sydney does, it, it does tend to overshoot more than in, any other city. And, and we saw at this cycle that yeah. pricing shot up 70 and then dropped, you know, about 11, 11 or 12 percent. So yeah, it's still pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, amazing yeah. during that time. I mean, exactly. I mean, Melbourne, Melbourne didn't swing up as hard and didn't fall as hard. And then you, and then at the same time, you had markets like Hobart and Geelong, which, saw some of the best growth that they'd ever seen. So, yeah. you know, it was it was an interesting time. I, I think too, I, I think the discussion is is so Sydney centric that yeah. um, you know, if you're coming in from another country and and people are saying prices are, you know, gonna fall twenty five percent, um, you know, not realising that that's actually, you know, one capital city where yeah. people are thinking that's gonna happen is, yeah. you know, would would possibly be quite surprising. Yeah, it's quite myopic. I, what frustrates me in the game, actually, uh, Nerida, is that because uh, all the decision makers, whether it be through government, uh, whether it be through the banks and whether it be through the media, uh, most of them live in Sydney and therefore they have a very myopic view of life generally. But what tends to happen is that uh, across the board lateral decisions are made that affect uh, every part of the country. So let's take the lending landscape as an example uh, where the combination of the Royal Commission and the work that APRA and ASIC were already doing to really put the handbrake on that space uh, has become a self-fulfilling prophecy in relation to tightening credit to the point where it's strangled demand, which, surprise, surprise, has flattened prices. Uh, and then that's ramped up by the, the media. You've got this situation where uh, Sydney tends to be driving uh, policy across the the, the the nation and and I think the sooner we move to a more regional approach, uh, the better off uh, property uh, owners in any format are going to be. What's what's your view around that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spend a, a lot of time in in Perth, I head over there sort of you know three to four times a year, and um, 
and it was interesting during that time. I, I remember 2017, you know, we started to see very, very early signs of, of recovery in the Perth market and, you know, it was looking really, really good and mm. um, rental demand in particular was picking up finally. Yeah. So, you know, Perth has just been tough for, for so long and so there was finally a little bit of good news and then the Royal Commission happened and um, completely derailed that recovery. So, you know, I think for people in Perth, all this talk around, you know, the best property conditions ever or the worst property conditions ever, you know, it is, you know, almost always the opposite for them that they, you know, they see quite different circumstances and, and far less finance led and more, more resources led. So yes. it is a, it is a very, very different market over there, but, um, very frustrating for them when, you know, finance is being restricted at a time when really they could do, do with an easing up in finance. Yeah, like, let's talk about the finance piece in particular because I, I guess I'm a very uh, strong believer that property is a game of finance and access to credit does have a major impact on, on value drivers. And there's been a lot of talk recently that, yes, the, the, the banks are um, lessening the restrictions, but what we're seeing on a day-to-day basis is that, yes, they've dropped down their servicing buffer and they've released a couple of other things, but for every release they're making, they're adding additional pressure around living expenses and debt-to-income ratios and a bunch of other exercises where, uh, you know, if we go back five years, RBA dropping rates would have had a major impact on demand, but we've gone from a, a single lever to a... a Hello, mo- sorry, you cut out. Yeah, we've, we've sort of moved from a, a single lever exercise with rates to a, a multiple combination lock now with a whole series of policy measures uh, that, that have, aren't showing much signs of lessening other than that the banks are profits are down and that will probably start to put some upward pressure on uh, taking the, that strain off access to credit more. What, what's your view around that and the impact that that's going to have on uh, the markets in terms of uh, access to credit over the, the next short term, one to two years? Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, obviously the Royal Commission over, it was, um, we have seen an easing up of finance, but it hasn't got anywhere near to, to where we saw it back in, in 2015, for example. Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, the banks do get hit over the head a lot. I mean, the Royal Commission obviously need to be done. There was a lot of stuff going on that, that really shouldn't have been going on. But, you know, on one hand being told, don't land. Um, you're causing a lot of problems to, you know, within a couple of months to being told to, to lend and to get the, the economy moving again. And, um, you know, be quite, it can be quite difficult in a big, big organization like a bank where they're not easily, you know, they can't easily move that quickly. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I think things around expenses, I, I, look, I don't think it'll change. I think there will continue to be a focus around responsible lending and, um, the more that we see the more the more that information and data is shared, the more that that will be um, the case. So you know the, yeah. the fact that banks can more easily find out people's financial situation will be will be a factor. Yeah. Um, I do I do look I, I think it will continue to ease up, and we are starting to see an increase in finance commitments through ABS data. Um, we're finding on our site that. Investors, investor activity. Well, one of the, I mean, look, there's lots of measures we look at, but one measure that we can actually track the difference between how um, first-time buyers are versus owner occupiers versus investors are is looking through our email inquiry data. So, um, so you know, if you email an agent, there's an option to to tick what sort of buyer you are, and yeah. um, and so we're looking a bit more closely at that data to see what's happening around um, the different buyer groups, and and what we can see is that. Since May, we, we've seen quite a, a, a general shift upwards of first home buyer activity. Um, yeah. We've seen a big uptick in owner occupiers. So basically, from October, we've just seen this surge of interest from owner occupiers. But investors still remain pretty flat. So I think it comes a lot back to the fact that what you were saying around getting finance—that that's still yeah. really, really tough for a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think too. I, I think too. A lot of them. A lot of investors would have got a little bit, not a little bit. I mean, some would have got had a big impact, have had a big impact from um, some of the quality issues that have emerged out of new developments as yes, well. And yes. yeah. um, particularly Sydney. I mean, you know, the the number of 
Um, I mean, it's, they're not, there's not a lot of them, but again, you know, coming back to the media, it was, you know, it was a pretty terrible time for people with, you know, with the Opal Tower cracking and the flammable cladding issue in Melbourne. You know, there was a lot of, um, fear, I think, from that. So I think, you know, that, that would have been an issue. Then, then falling values made people nervous, you know, and people yeah. were, people are not, I mean, people that have invested for a long time are, are fully aware that markets don't always go up, but, you know, I think for people that may may have started investing between 2011 and 2017, it you know it would have felt like a very good time to be buying. And you know, when when prices started to fall and all that negative media came out, then you know suddenly it wasn't such a good idea. So I think I think it will take a little bit of time before investors come back um, for a multitude of reasons. Yeah. Um, but obviously, finance is is really key. If they can't get money, then then that makes it very difficult for them. Yeah, and that's that's what we're seeing. We're we're seeing an appetite, but uh, the the capacity is not there because of those ongoing finance restraints. And as I say, what what I what I'm seeing, Narada, is that we're seeing uh, the RBA and the government starting to put pressure on now to say, well, we need we need to get people back in. The banks' profits are suffering. You know, for the first time ever, we've seen some pretty major drops in profitability, and the loan book represents a big big portion of their income. So. My view of that is that economic forces are going to drive a, a relaxation in in lending criteria within the realms of safety. So hang on to your hats. Uh, given that scenario, if you if you are in a position to buy, now's a bloody good time to to be doing it. Yeah, I mean, the, and the other thing too is, um, I suppose one other aspect that will help things is is open banking and yes. digital banks coming in, and yeah. um, and I think this is too is is one of the things that. Well, there's a few things frustrating for the RBA. I mean, the first one is that they're cutting rates, but then they're not getting passed on in full. So that's, you know, that's a frustration. It sort of gruntens the, the impact of, of a rate cut. But, um, but also that people, you know, there, there are a lot of lenders out there and people do seem to be very loyal to, to the big four. Yeah. But, you know, you don't need to be, you no know, way. there are, there, there are definitely a lot of different, um, home loan providers out there that, you know, you can, you can speak to and, um, you know, I, I mean, we, we obviously own a mortgage broking business. So, you know, I thought we're, you know, I'm not completely independent here, but, you know, we, we know what a good service mortgage brokers are in terms of being able to get unearthed some of the better deals. So. Well, we're the same. Of, the big, big portion of our business is in the, the finance breaking space. And, you know, there's, there's a 55% variation across the lenders in terms of what you can borrow based on exactly the same uh, finance profile. And there's a, there's 40 plus lenders offering over 2,000 different loan solutions out there. So I'm like you, I'm, I never cease to be amazed by the loyalty that's shown the big four banks, with the big, big four banks showing no customer loyalty other than raping that loyalty in terms of often. Uh, not passing on the full amount to existing customers where they'll, they'll bend over backwards to get a new customer. It's, uh, quite interesting. But I, I take an aside. So, hey, uh, I would love to go around the grounds now if I can, Narada. And, and uh, what I'd like to focus on if we could, uh, because the people that we tend to help most, are those that are looking for often new build properties because they, if they set up and structured well, then from a cash flow affordability perspective uh, in an area that's got long-term sustainable growth. So we're looking for that sustainability over a, a, at least a 10 and more likely a 15 plus year period. If we go around the place based on the search activity that, that you're seeing and any other predictive indicators that, that you're using to look at where where particular locations might be going. If we go state to state, can you sort of give us a run through your, your thinking around where where things are heading? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so starting with Sydney, I mean, we, we, we can see um, from a, um, a search perspective and an imbalance between search and listings that Sydney is, is really leading the charge at the moment. Um, flying through to pricing, you know, we can see again, Northern Beaches is, is one of the top areas in Australia at the moment in terms of price growth. Um, Eastern suburbs doing well. Um, Western Sydney still lagging, but you know, that's pretty consistent early cycle that we, we, we do see, you know, the best, well, not the best, you know, the premium locations start to pick up first and then we see that flow on effect to, to other markets. Yeah. Um, Sydney, we're still seeing, um, oh, another, 
good sign in Sydney is we're, we're seeing a big pickup in um, inquiry for house and land. So, you know, that hasn't happened for a long time, but last few months has been Is that um, first time buy driven? You are pr- probably. I mean, that, that's one that we can't t- tell. That's that's looking yeah. through our developer site. But yeah. um, you know, we know that they're, they're obviously big buyers of house and land. So, so that's um, there's probably a driver there. Yeah, just just um, uh, jumping in there quickly. The most of the uh, listeners, uh, when they invest, if they're looking to either buy or build, they're generally in the price bracket between sort of uh, five hundred to six fifty ish. Uh, and mm-hmm. that that price pointing becomes the the entry level that we then go and search for. What what's the highest growth location at that price point around the country? Yeah. Uh, with yep. that sort of filter in in play, can we sort of then look look state by state and area by area uh, with your view on on where those opportunities might be? So five hundred to six fifty. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. So I guess Sydney. Kind of knocks out a lot, a lot of. Yeah. I mean, you can probably get a get an apartment. I mean, we you know we're seeing a bit of growth in. Oh, I mean, there's. I mean, places like. Oh, where do we see Central Coast? You know, yep. Central Coast is a market that that we continue to see a lot of activity. I think I think it's an affordability driver that you know younger people are moving up there to yeah. um to get access to a nice lifestyle. Yeah. Um. Oh, the other, I mean, the other area in New South Wales that's really strong from a, um, a search perspective and particularly rental search, which is interesting, is basically moving up north from Byron Bay to southern Gold Coast. Okay. So basically, so Tugan down to Byron, that whole spine is, um, is very strong at the moment. So again, I think it's still, you know, again, that Sydney affordability aspect of sort mm. of pushing people um, to places effect. like Central Coast, yeah, yeah, and pushing them, pushing them up north. Um, yeah. Newcastle, we're seeing quite a bit of demand. Uh, you know, probably mining led. I mean, this is another big trend nationally that we're seeing is is a lot of mining towns uh, have been seeing quite good rental growth for some time, going through the pricing. Um, they are areas you obviously need to be yeah. super careful. We're a bit, we're <laughs> you a need bit to get in. No, I think a lot of people are. I mean, you, you want to get in and out pretty quickly. So. Oh, yeah. It's um you know somewhere like Dysart, which is not a very nice place to live, but has <laughs> close access to mines, is you know is doing very well. But yeah, it is yeah. a yeah you do they do swing quite a lot. Yeah, let, um, let's jump into let, let's move into uh, uh, um, Queensland uh, yeah. and around those price points for a long long term growth play. Uh, that, yeah, what, what's your thinking around that? Uh, okay, so long term, I think for, for houses, the best price growth will be Gold Coast, and yeah. primarily because Gold Coast is restricted to land. So, yeah. um, so it yeah. is an area that you know you're just not going to be able to build much over the long term. It, it will become more dense, but you know if you if you own a house on the Gold Coast, I think you probably uh, do, will do quite well over the long term. Brisbane, yeah, Brisbane, I'm not as bullish on primarily because they can build. More easily, so yeah. um, there's not the same land restrictions. Sunshine Coast is is cheaper than the Gold Coast, depending where. Obviously, not Noosa, but you know, moving moving to some of those suburban areas is pretty good too. But I think you know, Southeast Queensland in general is is looking fairly positive yeah. long term. But yeah. you know, for me, I think it's it's really Gold Coast that's going to be driving it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. If we um, Slip into my home state of South Oz. It's it's always been the sort of uh, Bradley of the of the property market, and just keeps chugging along where others come and go. But what's your feeling around um, the opportunities that you're seeing uh, in search activity in good old SA? Yeah, um, SA is interesting. I mean, it, it did just continue to go, grow during the the downturn. It was a it's been an interesting market. It doesn't seem, didn't we obviously didn't get hit that hard. So. Mm. Um, I mean, what we what we find an interesting mix between buy versus rent search in Adelaide. We we see very very strong buy search in the inner suburbs of Adelaide, Adelaide Hills. We yeah. see a lot of activity from buyers. Yeah. Um, interesting interstate search. We see a lot of um, interstate search looking at um, beachside. You know, so Glenelg and and that area. We yes. see a lot of interstate search. So you know, from an inter from a yeah from that perspective, that's quite interesting. Um, but rent, rent is quite different. So very, very high rental demand in, um, far cheaper suburbs. So moving, you know, north and south of, of those high demand buy areas, we see very strong rental demand. So, um, I think it's probably related to jobs. You know, I think there's, yeah. there, there has been some pretty decent jobs 
growth in Adelaide, but I think also that investors, because investors concentrate in inner and Adelaide Hills, there's probably fairly good rental supply in those areas and not so good in, in some of the cheaper locations. So, yeah. um, if you're wanting a tenant, um, you know, that's, that's probably something to look for. Yeah. Um, interestingly too, if you have a look at rental yield, the highest rental yields for a capital city are actually in Adelaide and in places like Elizabeth and Elizabeth North. So, um, again, you know, not, not, city, not suburbs that a lot of people would want to invest in, but in terms of rental yield, they are, they are looking pretty attractive. Yeah. Well, we often talk about investors going on the, the, the growth to cash flow curve. So start with growth and, and then end in cash flow as, as cash flow yielders. Uh, at the end of the investment journey, those locations, uh, work pretty well. So, yes. uh, yeah, awesome. Okay. Well, let's, let's jump to WA for a minute because uh, I've, I've got to say that we've been looking pretty closely at WA and you've made a couple of comments. We, we're a bit contrarian in relation to identifying if we get in uh, early enough before that, that growth spike occurs, uh, you can sort of give yourself a leg up in terms of equity growth. Uh, we're seeing sort of rental yields coming back quite a bit in recent times. Uh, what, what's your view of uh, Perth and the sorts of areas that might, within those price parameters I'm talking about, represent some opportunities moving forward? Yeah, per- I mean, Perth is, I mean, it's been really tough, but um, at the moment, uh, premium Perth is is doing really well in terms of buyer demand. We're seeing some fairly decent price growth in, in some of the best western suburbs of, of Perth. Yeah. Um, very different, though, uh, in terms of search in inner Perth compared to middle and outer ring suburbs. And okay. um, outer ring in particular, I think you do need to be very wary of that, you know, some of those house and land suburbs have seen uh, a lot of building taking place. Um, you know, a lot of people paid at very high prices during the boom yeah. in those locations, and there does seem to be quite a bit of. When you have a look at some, of it, when when the banks release some of their just you know some of the the data sets around distress, we often see Perth come up, and it is primarily those parts of Perth where there's distress. But um, in a Perth, amazing uh, rental demand is is really picking up. So I think I think the market's turning in Perth, but you know I think you do have to be mindful; it's not going to get to boom time. No, conditions no. anytime soon. It's it's going to be a kind long-term of steady, play. yeah, yeah, a long term play. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, most of our investors are fifteen year plus. So if we're talking a fifteen to twenty year sort of timeline, I think that there are some opportunities there. Recognizing that there's, you're not going to see anything flash over the next five to ten. So yeah, I think you need to be careful. I I, I do think that there's definitely opportunities, but yeah, you, yeah, you just need to be a little bit more careful where you pick. Mm, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Victoria then. You've, you've t- spoken about uh, Melbourne and, and Geelong and, and Ballarat. And I, I guess Geelong and Ballarat, uh, in particular, Geelong's had a pretty good run as a result of some government incentives and some decentralisation. And it, it's obviously going to do very well as a re- result of the first home buyer incentives that have, uh, uh, now been promoted by the federal government. So there'll be ongoing growth there. Uh, there's been talk about Ballarat with the rail extension and, and the first home buyer exercise will give that a, a shift. Uh, I have some nervousness around the critical mass and the diversity of employment to support that in, in Ballarat, but that's just a personal mm. view. What, what's, what's your read of, of um, Victoria and the current play? Uh, look, I, I think Geelong, I mean, Geelong's going to be an outperformer, I think, over the next decade, and a lot of it comes back to government investment and in particular if that fast rail gets up and running there's been um, I think two billion dollars allocated in in this year's budget federal budget for for the fast rail from Geelong to, to Melbourne and mm. um, yeah that that would be a game changer I mean taking a, a half an hour commute to half an hour would you know significantly change people's ability to get in and out of Geelong so I think that that will be a, a good one yeah. Um, yeah Melbourne I mean Melbourne's um, doing well again at the moment. You know, we can see that there's some, some good um, prices starting to come through and some decent search coming through as well. Uh, like Sydney, it does seem to be a little bit premium-led at the moment. And, yes. um, you know, a good, a good example is really Turak. It was, um, you know, three years ago, Turak was really down in terms of views per listing, but now it's in the top ten. So, yeah. you know, given that it's Melbourne's most expensive suburb, that was that was quite interesting. Um, 
the areas in Melbourne, I mean, there's a lot of areas I find interesting in Melbourne. I guess the western suburbs is one, and that gentrification of Footscray out to Sunshine is is quite interesting to see that, mm. you know, there's a, a lot of young people moving to that area and starting to really improve the housing stock. And, um, and, and that's happened. I mean, I've been in Sydney now nearly five years, and how that Sunshine, for example, has changed over five years, I can't believe. Because mm. I mean, Sunshine, when I left, was... You know, Sunshine Plaza was was seen as quite dangerous, but now you know a lot of a lot of young people are moving there, so it's it, you know it is it is rapidly changing. So I think Western Melbourne's interesting. Yeah. Um, the other area that's interesting is the outer northeast and the outer east, and um, you know places like Bar Hill, Montmorency, Seville. You know those areas are are places that offer lifestyle, big homes, big blocks, reasonably easy to get into the city, and you know I think those areas will continue to see pretty. Uh, decent conditions over over the long term. Mm, what, what about down on the Morning Peninsula? What's your read of uh, what's likely to happen in that neck of the woods? Yeah, I mean that that area has changed a lot, and I mean a lot of it's to do with the fact there's better transport links into Melbourne. So, I mean, what we have yeah. seen long term is is that it has become more of a, um, a residential location as yes. opposed to purely a, a holiday location. Yeah. Um, I'm actually writing a, an article for the Australian for next year, looking at the most popular. Um, premium beachside locations and, and Flinders is actually coming up as, as number one. So I, I just had a look at the data this morning. So mm. I have to have a bit of a closer look, but it is looking like Flinders is one that's, you know, in terms of a, a you know, very, very top expensive location seems to be the, the pick at the moment. But I mean, Monty Peninsula is quite diverse. I mean, you've got places like, um, you know, hit Rosebud's a lot cheaper, obviously, than say Portsea, but they're not yeah. actually that that far from each other. Yeah, and then on the other flip side, you've got Hastings, which is sort of quite quite low, but uh, then some 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 high areas coming inland into the sort of Balnarings and those sort of locations. So, yeah, yeah, Red Hill and those locations. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a diversity there, but some I, I think some pretty good opportunity given the fact that, as you well mentioned, the infrastructure links are now much improved and the the uh, commute has been cut substantially, so uh, it's moving from that sort of holiday zone into a, a commuter zone with some, some pretty good opportunity down there. Yes, yeah. Interesting. Okay, we won't talk about Tassie because I'm mindful of your time and I think uh, because of the lack of critical mass, it's not an area that we uh, point uh, investors in any in any way and it's had a bit of a, a bull run of recent mm. times with Hobart and the flow on to Launceston. Uh, my big question around Tassie is its sustainability from a, an investor's perspective. Mm. Uh, I think it's got some challenges there. The owner occupied is a beautiful place to live, no question. But as a long term investor, I, there's probably better growth, more sustainable growth locations on the mainland. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, yeah, I mean, the Tasmanian economy has changed. So, you know, we can see that that was, what was really the driver. I, I can see Hobart. Long system, I, I'm not as confident it will maintain the growth. But yeah. Yeah. the other thing, I guess, for Tassie is that the building industry is pretty slow. So I think that's, yeah. that's probably been a, one of the biggest drivers of, of why price growth has continued to surge. Okay, well, it's been awesome, uh, Nerida. I, I just want to close on the quick five questions that the listeners always want our guest views on. And mm-hmm. the first of those is, what is your favourite quote and why? Oh, God. I probably should have um, read my notes yeah. before I came on. <laughs> uh, gosh. I don't know. I'm going to come back to that one. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, this one's yeah, let me come back to one. This one's a bit easier. What's the top book that you'd recommend people read and why? Um, okay, so I I really love um, the Freakonomics books. Yeah. I find them very, very fascinating. And um, I'm, I'm not a theoretical macroeconomist. I love... The, I love looking at smaller markets and I love looking at the, um, the dynamics between people and things and how changes to things, so changes to policy, for example, can lead to quite big social changes. And, yeah. and I love, I love what they do. You know, they, they just look at things so differently and, um, and, and put a, an economic lens on things that are quite so, you know, social. 
related. Yeah, I, I, I love yeah, the way they I blend. Yeah, I really the, enjoy them. They, they sort of bring together the head and the heart. A lot of economics is very head-based, whereas yes. you know, biobehaviour is often emotionally driven. And the, yes. the way they can combine that to really then have a better handle on predicting what what change impacts will occur is probably much more balanced, I think. Would yes. That be a fair read? Yes. Yeah. 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 This, this one's a bit of left field, uh, but it's a question that just about every listener uh, wants to get people's thoughts on. What's the top legal thing that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay? <laughs> What's the top? Legal thing that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay. Um, well, I have very, a very easy tax situation. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I'm not a complicated investor or anything. So um, what's the top legal thing? Probably, I don't know, maybe the, the working from home allowance yeah. that they put in is probably one that I've, I've used in the past. Yeah, no, easy. Yep. And the back on the investment subject, what's the, the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received? Uh, the best has been to buy a home to live in. Yeah. Is the best. Um, I, you know, I just think we, we bought when we were quite young. So yep. um, buying in, I mean, we didn't buy a great house and we spent too much renovating it. But, you know, <laughs> despite that, it, it ended up being a, put us in, you know, quite a, quite a different position. Yeah. Um, the worst investment advice, I mean, I do, I do hear, you know, I suppose the, the worst I hear is, um, for people to get a portfolio of properties very, very quickly and not be mindful of market trends and not be mindful of the fact that, you know, you can't, there's a lot of expenses related to investing in property yeah. and, um, and you know, I, I suppose the one that really stood out was that what case, I think there was a couple that was suing Westpac around lending to them, um, for a lot of properties they bought in mining towns around Australia. I think I've got the, the story right, but you, you know, that one, I, I just thought, oh, you know, you could see at the time people getting caught up in, in the excitement of, of buying in mining towns and seeing the growth, but you know, that rapid turnaround in conditions was, um, you know, it was, it was quite, you know, quite, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. And, uh, if you were highly leveraged in that market, it was, it would have been devastating. And, you know, I, I think it, you do need to be careful to spread risk and you do need to be careful to keep in mind that markets don't always go up. They do go down and holding property can be expensive if you don't have a tenant. Absolutely. And I, diversifying, uh, your asset base and being borderless, but also engaging a, a team of proven professionals that, that it, it's giving you good quality advice around. That's pretty key as well. It's it's I I, I find it difficult uh, for someone to blame the bank uh, when uh, there are a lot of good operators out there uh, that are independent and professional that can sort of direct you without allowing yourself to dig a hole like some of those people have. What's what's your view on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That you do need to, um, yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, final question: uh, a personal habit that contributes to your success so far, Marita? Uh I'm I'm very disciplined, so I um, I exercise. I get up very very early, and I exercise every morning. Um, I go to bed pretty early, so <laughs> 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 kind of boring. Um, <laughs> But I, yeah, I guess, I guess it's that, you know, getting exercising in the morning is, is something that has helped me. You know, I think dealing with stress, it's been, it's helpful to, to do pretty hard, hard exercise. So, totally. um, so yeah, that, that's something I'm, I'm very disciplined in, um, in how I, how I do that. Yeah, love that. Yeah, it's, and if you start there, that discipline then folds into everything else you do as well. So, yeah, it's a, a underappreciated value that, that I, I see very consistently around anyone who achieves sustainable success. All right, very last question. If I gave you a microphone that spoke to everyone in the world, and that's all 7.7 billion of us, and I gave you one minute to talk, what would you say? Oh, God, that's a hard one. <laughs> one minute to talk. 
Um, oh my goodness. A microphone on, um, uh, you know, I'd probably talk about the importance of buying your first home and getting into the market early. Cause I think that's something that, uh, I, I don't think, you know, I, I know prices don't always go up and I don't think that is, um, that is the reason to buy a, a home to live in. But I do know that people that buy young, um, pay off a home are just in such a dramatically different situation once they retire. And, um, in terms of financial advice, I, besides paying off a credit, you know, not putting yourself into credit card debt, you know, I think that really is the, is the most critical for people long term, for long term, um, financial security. Yeah, it's for saving. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, one hundred percent. The and I'll circle back to that favourite quote. Have you thought of one? Yeah, I was, I was thinking through that, and I think the, I think the main one for me is be yourself. Everyone's always taken, and you know that for me that in the end, if you're not authentic, then then people see through it. So, um, and also to to do a job, your you know, every anyone's job properly. If you if you can't be yourself, then then it is a it is a very difficult thing to to do. Well, that's a great piece of advice to end on. Uh, you are very authentic uh, narrator that comes across in everything you do, and it's it's I, I guess the reason why I uh, have a lot of respect for the insights that you bring to the table. Uh, wish you uh, the best moving forward uh, in all of your work you're doing with REA, and would love to get you back on uh, sort of periodically. We sort of want to ro- revisit what's happening in the market and what what trends are telling us and where it's going. There's no better person than you to do that. So we're uh, very appreciative of your time today, Narada. Thanks for having me. Been awesome. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash Get Invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow.